The redundancy principle states that when you have a multimedia lesson that involves images and narration, then this additional on-screen text that shows exactly what I'm saying is considered redundant and unhelpful. Now, there are a lot of exceptions to this principle, so it helps to start with the basics. In the video on the coherence principle, I discuss the difference between the information delivery and the knowledge construction views of learning. If you haven't seen that video, you can click on the link here or find it in the description down below. Basically, the information delivery view sees learners as passive individuals waiting for information to be poured into their heads. Consistent with this view is the learning styles hypothesis, which states that everyone has their own learning style and teachers should cater to those styles. Research has shown that there's no evidence that supports the existence of learning styles or that students actually benefit when teachers present material according to their learning style. I won't go into debunking the learning styles hypothesis here as there are plenty of videos that do that really well and I'll provide the links to those videos and to the research down below if you're interested. What's relevant here is that the redundancy principle directly contradicts the learning styles hypothesis. According to the learning styles hypothesis, visual learners will only focus on the picture, readers will only focus on the text, and auditory learners will only pay attention to their narration. Under this assumption, having pictures, on-screen text, and narration on at the same time is totally fine. However, the cognitive theory of multimedia learning believes that there's a limit on how much information we can process through our visual and auditory channels at any given time. When you present students with pictures and on-screen texts, both of which comes through the visual channel, you risk creating cognitive overload. The original set of studies on the redundancy principle involved a narrated animation on lightning, with one group of students presented with only animation and narration, and another with on-screen text added. The study showed that students who were presented with only pictures and narration did better, with relatively large effect sizes ranging from 0.72 to 1.21. Follow-up studies involved materials presented as a game, virtual reality, or interactive lesson. The results still showed that students presented with only pictures and narration did better, but the redundancy effect was smaller because students in the redundant group had control over the pace of the learning. This means they were able to take the time to process the on-screen text and minimize cognitive overload. What about students learning with the material in a second language? In one study, international students at an American university were presented with materials in English, with one group given pictures with narration and another with on-screen text in English added. The results showed that adding on-screen text did not make a significant difference. However, in another group, in which researchers presented students in Korea with materials in English, the group given the redundant on-screen text did better than the group without the on-screen text. The difference in results had to do with the participants. The international students were already learning English at their university and may have been fluent enough in the language not to benefit from the on-screen text, whereas the students in Korea did benefit from the on-screen text because it helped reduce the extraneous processing needed to understand the speaker. Here, it helps to remember that cognitive processing can come in many forms. The effort to make sense of new material and fitting it into your prior knowledge takes up cognitive processing. However, other things can also use up our cognitive processing capacity, such as the need to understand material in another language. Another study which involves adults in chronic pain also showed a benefit to having on-screen text because the text helped offset the cognitive drain they experienced from their chronic pain. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, when I watch movies at home, I always have to turn on subtitles, even if it's in a language I understand. Doesn't that contradict the redundancy principle? Not really. If you're straining to hear the dialogue, either because the character is mumbling, or there's music and sound in the background, or some other reason, the strain adds to your cognitive processing, so having subtitles mean that you're no longer straining to hear what the characters are saying. However, when you're reading the subtitles, you're most likely missing a lot of what's happening on other parts of the screen. But since you're most likely watching a movie for entertainment, that's less of an issue. But if you're designing multimedia for learning, then everything you present matters and you want to avoid cognitive overload as much as possible. 
So where does that leave us with the redundancy principle? As a rule of thumb, it's a good idea to provide viewers with the option of turning on subtitles. If you're designing multimedia that learners can advance at their own pace, then providing the options of having on-screen text in addition to the narration is not going to be an issue and might even be helpful. However, if you're doing a presentation and viewers don't have control over the pacing, then it's best to reduce the amount of redundant text on screen. Also, remember that the redundancy principle only applies to lessons that involve something visual that you want students to look at, as well as narration. If there's no visual, then having on-screen text with narration is less of an issue. Just keep in mind what viewers have to process in their visual and auditory channels and think about any additional cognitive processing they might experience and do your best to strike a balance.